I'd like to call the meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Uh, we're still having technical difficulties with the PowerPoint, but we can proceed without it. It may be able to be fixed before we get to that point, but if not, we will simply do without it. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Would the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Stephen Onstott? Here. Chair Leo Molitor? Here. Commissioner Michael Wessner? Present. Commissioner Richard Rodriguez? Here. Item four on the agenda is a time for public comments by citizens for those items not on the agenda. I haven't received any cards on that, so I assume there are no speakers speaking on something that's not on the agenda. Item five is GP09-003, ZN09-002, and ZN09-003, the County of Ventura is the applicant. I'd like to inform you what the procedure of the meeting generally is. We have the applicant, in this case it's the the planning staff will make a, a presentation. After that, we will have uh, disclosures by the Planning Commission regarding today's agenda. Next, there will be questions that the commissioners may want to ask the, the staff. Then we'll have, we will open a public hearing. We will have a, uh, a presentation by the applicant and then we will hear speakers in favor of the requested action. And then generally following that, we hear uh, uh, speakers opposed, but we have four or five speakers who are in between, so I'll, I'll put them in between the favored and opposed. Uh, there's a rebuttal by the applicant to any of the testimony given. At that time, I, I will close the public hearing and we will begin discussion and eventually lead to a vote on the issue. So I'd like to start out now with the presentation of the staff, Mr. Hawkins. Good morning, Good morning Chairman Molitor, members of the commission. My name is Dennis Hawkins with the County Planning Division. The matter before you is phase two of the Scenic Resources Protection Program. Uh, this includes a general plan amendment to amend the goals, policies, and programs and the resources appendix of the general plan, the Thousand Oaks area plan and the Lake Sherwood area plan, a rezoning to remove the scenic resource protection overlay zone from portions of the Lake Sherwood area of interest, and a zone change text amendment that would uh, modify the requirements of the scenic resource protection overlay zone. At the present time, the scenic resources uh, protection is applied to four county designated scenic lakes, Lake Casitas, Lake Piru, uh, Lake Matillaha, and Lake Sherwood, and within a half mile of Highway 33 north of uh, Wheeler Springs hot, uh, Resort Area. Additionally, uh, the Ojai Valley Area Plan designates areas within 400 feet of, of prominent ridges in the, within the Ojai Valley Area of Interest and the Thousand Oaks area plan designates certain hillside properties within the Thousand Oaks area of interest. The Scenic Resources Protection Program has been around since the early 1980s uh, when a land developer elected to remove a number of oak trees in anticipation of development near Lake Sherwood. Uh, the board's uh, response was to create a scenic resource protection zone around four county scenic lakes that would regulate tree removal and, and uh, grading within those areas. And over the years, the, the program has expanded to other areas and the ordinance itself has, has morphed into what it is today. The more recent uh, history of this program 
uh, began in, in 2007 when the Board of Supervisors directed the planning division to tighten up the standards for ridgeline and hillside protection policies, particularly in the Ojai and the Thousand Oaks area. The planning division's response was to initiate a, a two-phase program, uh, scenic resource protection program. Uh, the first phase was completed in September 2008 and that uh, consolidated the, exist, the then existing scenic highway protection overlay zone with the scenic resource protection overlay. And since the direction of the board at that time was to tighten up the standards, we incorporated the more restrictive policies of, of the scenic highway zone in the scenic resource protection zone which exists today. Uh, one thing that I would point out is, is at that time one of the issues that was raised is the county staff had recommended a general exemption from obtaining a uh, discretionary permit up until that, well, let me just, the, the requirements of the scenic research protection at the present time are if you want to grade more than a thousand square feet, remove more than a thousand square feet of natural vegetation, uh, construct any new structure of any size, or expand an existing structure by more than 10% requires a discretionary permit, even if no other discretionary permits are required if a property is within the scenic resource zone. County staff had recommended at that time a general exemption that would have exempted the requirement to get a, a discretionary permit if the landowner could show that the proposed improvement wasn't going to be visible from a public viewing location. Uh, within a half mile of the site. Your commission took exception to the half mile limitation, uh, correctly pointing out that some, some projects could have a scenic resource impact at a greater distance and recommended that that uh, exemption, the general exemption be removed and the Board of Supervisors accepted your recommendation. But one of the perhaps unintended consequences of that is now under the current ordinance every Every structure requires a permit, whether it's a small barbecue in the backyard or, or a gazebo or whatever, even if nobody can see it but the landowner himself. And that's not really the intent of the uh, Scenic Resource Protection Zone. Uh, the intent of the Scenic Resource Protection Zone is to protect public views of natural resources. Uh, Phase two of the uh, Scenic Resource Protection commenced in March of 2009, and that consisted of a, a series of meetings with the Ojai Valley Municipal Advisory Council uh, to review the scenic resource policies of the Ojai Valley Area Plan. And uh, the Municipal Advisory Council was also considering expanding the scenic resource protection zone to hillside areas within the Ojai Valley Area of Interest. Uh, a public hearing was held in September of uh, 2009 and following that public hearing the Municipal Advisory Council elected not to forward any uh, any of the recommendations to your council which is why there is no uh, Ojai Valley Area Plan component of this project. Uh, project does include a rather minor amendments to the countywide general plan. Apparently we have a PowerPoint now. Uh, to the countywide uh, general plan that uh, uh, basically conforms to the proposed zone change. If you approve the zone change, it's necessary to, to change the countywide goals, policies, and programs document and the resources appendix so that there's not an internal inconsistency between the zoning and the general plan. Uh, in addition, uh, figure one of the uh, goals, policies, and programs document would be amended. Uh, again, to be consistent with the proposed rezoning, basically creating a little donut hole in the uh, Lake Sherwood area uh, view shed, uh, uh, representing the area that would be rezoned. And just so that we're a little bit clear, within the, this is the the Lake Sherwood view shed, the area in green are areas designated as rural and open space. They, these areas would retain the scenic resource protection overlay zone. The areas in 
whoops, gold. In the, in the center of this area is the area that the scenic resource protection zone would be removed. These areas are basically developed with a golf course and single family homes is largely already developed this time. The uh, Lake Sherwood community is basically an area of very large single family homes uh, surrounded by essentially undeveloped uh, mountainous areas. Uh, the staff report indicates a number of reasons for allowing the rezone. Essentially it amounts to this. The scenic resource protection overlay zone is intended to protect natural views of uh, natural scenic views. In the in case of a, an urban, uh, urban community, those natural views have largely been converted to, to urban or man-made views. And th thus the scenic resource, the reasons to protect the scenic resource are largely already gone. Uh, additionally, the Lake Sherwood area is al already subject to the policies of the, uh, the Sherwood area plan, which largely mimic the requirements of the scenic resource protection zone. And most of this area is also subject to conditions of the original track map and residential plan development permits, which also regulate these areas and cover many of the same issues. So there's a certain amount of redundancy. This map shows uh, a little bit closer up of the the uh, different zoning within the uh, area where the scenic resource protection zone is to be removed. This entire area is, is designated as existing community on the general plan. Existing community uh, by the general plan is intended for urban land uses or areas where urban land uses already exist, uh, where zoning and, and the general plan intends that uh, urban, level, urban densities should occur. There are 10 different base zones in this area represented by the different colors. None of the base zones would change. The only change proposed is the removal of scenic resource protection overlay. In addition to uh, the general plan changes that we talked about, the general plan amendment would also affect the text of the Lake Sherwood area plan including uh, a change to biological resource policy number one, uh, which relates to tree protection. The intent of, of this change is to eliminate, uh, eliminate some inconsistencies with the tree protection ordinance and uh, some ambiguities related to the structure of the uh, table that uh, is included in this policy, which seem to create internal contradictions within the policy. We went back to the original Lake Sherwood EIR to find out what, what was intended and apparently there was a conversion issue between the text of the EIR and the, the table in the area plan and we proposed changes to reflect those that. Uh, additionally, scenic resource policy number four currently says that the entire view shed of Lake Sherwood should be included in scenic resource protection since that conflicts with the proposed rezone that policy should be at least amended, but we propose that it be eliminated because the balance of the policy simply repeats language that's already in the scenic resource protection ordinance. Uh, scenic resource policy number five would simply add a little bit of clarification to the grading standards, uh, primarily explaining why some of the standards are in there. And lastly, a, a definition to the tree protection, uh, to the a definition for a protected tree would be added to the area plan and the reason for that is, is because under the, the Lake Sherwood plan preceded the tree protection regulations. Uh, at the moment there is no standard in the area plan as to what, tree, what size tree needs to be replaced. The, the smallest seedling in theory should have to be replaced with a 24 inch box and two 15 inch and that doesn't make sense. So what we've added is a, is a definition that says a protected tree is what it says in the tree protection ordinance. Again, the Thousand Oaks area plan would also be amended. The text of Appendix 5.3, which relates to hillside development standards, the purpose of these changes are to more closely conform to the requirements of the City of Thousand Oaks Ridgeline Protection Ordinance. Um, 
to a remarkable extent, the Thousand Oaks Area Plan already reflects City of Thousand Oaks standards. That's not an accident. The reason for creating the Thousand Oaks Area Plan was to ensure that county development follows the, the city standards. However, since the area plan was adopted, uh, the City of Thousand Oaks put their hillside protection standards into an ordinance form and apparently there were some minor changes in the language. These changes basically would reflect. Mr. Hawkins, if I could just stop your second. Certainly. <clears throat> and this is one of the reasons is because this is in Thousand Oaks area of interest, so we're trying to make, make sure that we're somewhat compatible. Is that correct? Yes. The guidelines for orderly development say that development within a city's area of interest uh, should follow the land use regulations of that city. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Uh, the grading, the, the standards when a grading permit Instead of being the current standard is 50 cubic yards, instead it would refer to the standards of the Scenic Resource Protection Overlay Zone Ordinance. Uh, requirement would be uh, change requiring city notification of any grading that exceeds 5,000 square feet. Currently, it's 1,000 cubic yards. Uh, standards for hillside development would be revised so that uh, homes in exceeding 17 feet and understand that 17 feet is not an absolute height limitation but reflects the height standard of the zoning ordinance which for pitched roofs includes is, is defined as the area midway between the, the top of the pitch and the bottom. Uh, so that 17 feet could actually go up to probably 20 or 21 feet or something depending on the, on the angle of the roof and the size of the building. Uh, but at any rate, the, the, the standard would say that the, essentially you'd be required to have single-story homes uh, in uh, near a bridge line. Uh, minor changes to the grading, similar to what uh, uh, what we talked about for Lake Sherwood. Applicants are directed to try to make their homes fit in with the hillside and minimize grading to the extent possible and uh, applicants are supposed to utilize uh, native vegetation when replanting uh, manufactured slopes. The uh, third component of this uh, program is a change to the text of the Scenic Resources Protection Ordinance. Uh, the general intent of this is to, is to uh, modify the standards so that fewer permits would require discretionary permit. The Board of Supervisors direction, as I told you, was to, maybe I didn't tell you, the Board of Supervisors directed us to uh, amend the, the, or to propose amendments to the Scenic Resource Protection Zone uh, that would eliminate the need for small structures and structures that can't be seen uh, from requiring discretionary permits. As I said, because uh, the general exemption was removed from the original uh, SRP changes in 2008, all structures, regardless of size and whether they could be seen or not seen uh, by the public, require permits. Uh, the first change that, that we proposed in the ordinance is a change in the type of discretionary permit that's required. Under the existing ordinance standards, a planned development permit is required for residential uses and a conditional use permit is required for non-residential uses. Planned residential development permits and CUPs are very similar, but their purposes are different. A planned residential permit is intended for uses that are permitted by right within the zone, but where the location or design of the structure needs to be reviewed in order to avoid uh, impacts. Uh, that's similar to what uh, happens under the SRP zone. A conditional use permit, on the other hand, is a use that is not necessarily permitted in the zone, but could be permitted if circumstances are appropriate uh, and conditions can be made to, to make it compatible with the surrounding area. The standards for approving either a conditional use permit or a discretionary permit are identical, with the exception of uh, item number E there, uh, which essentially requires that a finding be made that a project must be compatible not only with the existing surrounding uses, which both 
planned residential permits and conditional use permits must comply with, but also it looks forward to the future, must be compatible with future land uses as well. That's unique to the conditional use permit. As a result, conditional use permits must either be limited, uh, must have time limits, or must be reviewed periodically to ensure that compatibility still exists. Uh, and we believe that that's not appropriate for the scenic resource permits uh, review of a once you've approved a, a barn or a house or something in a scenic resource zone. It's, it, there's not a lot of public benefit in reviewing that 10 years down the road to see if the house is still compatible. The second change we've proposed are changes to the grading standards. Uh, at the present time, the the Ordinance requires a discretionary permit whenever grading exceeds a thousand square feet or two feet in height of cut or fill. The proposal is to ex expand that to allow cuts and fills up to five feet before a uh, discretionary permit is required. This is an example of a five foot uh, cut along Highway 33. However, the pad is actually quite a bit larger than a thousand square feet, of course. The next uh, area proposed for change is, relates to small structures. As we said, the board directed that we exempt small structures from the discretionary permit process. The existing standard requires a discretionary permit for any new structure. Uh, the proposed standard would limit discretionary permits to new development that exceeds 1,000 square feet, uh, provided that the structure does not exceed 15 feet in height. And again, as I mentioned, the height is is, is, it's not a, a straight 15 feet, it's the county zoning ordinance 15 feet, which is always a little different. Uh, and if it's not located near a prominent ridge line. And uh, that would allow a variety of, of accessory structures in, in residential and open space zones. The next standard that uh, is proposed to change is the uh, standard that uh, requires expansion of existing structure by more than 10% uh, requires a, a discretionary permit, the proposal would expand that to 20% uh, or 1,000 square feet, whichever is greater. The sign standard would also be modified to a, to a degree. Uh, the existing standard uh, limits uh, advertising signs to no more than four feet in height. Uh, the idea is to encourage uh, monument type signs like the one on the right and discourage tall pole signs like the one on the left. Uh, in addition, uh, the proposed standard would allow signs up to five feet in height uh, and would also regulate uh, identification and non-commercial message signs in addition to advertising signs. The existing scenic resource standards require a discretionary permit whenever a thousand square feet of vegetation, or natural vegetation, is removed, uh, except for an existing exception allows for uh, vegetation modification required by the fire department within 100 feet of a, of a building. Uh, the proposed ordinance changes would include an additional standard to exempt uh, basically county fire department approved uh, projects taken, uh, taken under the uh, community wildfire protection plan or a similar mechanism that has been approved by the county and requires separate environmental review. So therefore the scenic resource and biological resources of, of such activities would, would be addressed by under the California Environmental Quality Act, and therefore we'd eliminate a certain amount of redundancy in the process. And lastly, as we talked about, the general exception would be restored. Uh, the proposal is to exempt any structure where the landowner can demonstrate that the project, the, the proposed grading, or the proposed structure is not going to be visible from the uh, regional road network. Um, We've eliminated the, uh, the half-mile limitation, which your commission took issue with uh, about a year ago. 
um, but we think this will help restore some sanity to the system. Lastly, the uh, the effect of this is going to eliminate the need for uh, many disc discretionary permits. In the past year since the Scenic Resource Protection Zone was uh, approved by the Board of Supervisors, uh, 27 discretionary permits have been reviewed by the county. If the current standards or the proposed standards had been in place back then, more than 80 percent of them would have not been required. Um, many of those were for small backyard barbecues and and uh, small uh, expansions of existing buildings. Many of those occurred within the Lake Sherwood area of interest and would not require uh, permits under the existing under the proposed standards. And finally, the staff recommendation is that your commission recommend to the Board of Supervisors uh, they adopt the environmental standards and approve the negative declaration attached to your staff report and approve the general plan amendment, the zone change, and the zoning ordinance text amendment in accordance with the findings provided in your staff report. We have received uh, a number of comments, letters on, on this item. I'll just review them very quickly. Um, we received two comment letters that were attached to your staff report from Jason Maxwell, who opposes the both the proposed changes and the SRP ordinance itself. From Tina Rasnell, who opposes uh, ridgeline standards of, or prohibition on ridgeline development and, and the SRP zone. Uh, in addition, not attached to your staff report, but I believe submitted to you separately, uh, we received a communication from Ed Rinke from the City of Thousand Oaks, who proposes a, an additional change to the ordinance. Um, the city recognizes that when a, when a building is constructed within 100 feet of another property, the fire department requires a 100-foot clearance around the new structure, even if it's a different property. The city is concerned that some of these properties are but uh, publicly owned properties, Pasco properties, uh, and that putting a building on adjacent to one of those properties would place a, both a financial burden on the on Costco, but would also uh, affect the biological benefits of, of that public open space. And they're asking that, that the ordinance be amended to require a discretionary permit whenever a proposed structure is within 100 feet of a public designated public open space area within the Thousand Oaks area of interest. Uh, we also received communication from Chip Bosick, or Bosick, who favors the Scenic Resource Protection Ordinance uh, and opposes uh, efforts to eliminate the, the SRP zone completely. Uh, we also received a communication from James and Susan Jackson, who favors the Scenic Resource Protection Zone, but opposes proposals to water down the Scenic Resource Protection uh, Standards. We received a communication from Leonard Fisher from the Sherwood Country Club, uh, who's requesting a two-week extension so that he can study the issue further. We received a communication from Maria and Gaston DeSornis, who favors the proposed action. Uh, we received a communication from Richard Zalinga, who also requests a two-week extension. Uh, we received a communication from this morning from Carol Lang Langford, who supports the Scenic Resource Protection Zone, and from Bonnie Bittison, who supports changes to the Thousand Oaks area plan to be more consistent with the Ridgeline Protection policies of the city. And uh, we received a communication from Heather Wiley, uh, who is opposed to weakening of the SRP standards. Uh, and this concludes the staff presentation, unless there are questions by your commission. Before we have questions, At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. 
please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Commissioner Rodriguez? No disclosure. Commissioner Wessner? I have none either. Commissioner Onslaught? I have no disclosures. And the Chair has no disclosures. Would it be appropriate at this time to enter these exhibits that we have that you've spoken to? If so, I'd like to enter into the record exhibits A through I. And 13. Okay, now questions, any staff questions, any questions by the Commissioners to the staff? Commissioner Onslaught? Several people have commented about notice and due process and inability to respond in a timely fashion. Could you relate to us the efforts made to communicate with affected people? Yes. This project was advertised in November for a 30-day review of the negative declaration. Again, for this hearing today, there was an advertisement placed in the County Star, and notices were sent to all persons that requested notices, as well as all property owners in the Lake Sherwood area that would be affected by the zone change, as well as public agencies that would be affected by this project. Do you have any idea how many notices were mailed out, roughly? Over 600. 600? Yes, over 600. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Commissioner Rodriguez? Yeah, in your presentation, you were commenting about the height of structures, add-on structures within X number of feet of ridgeline. You used the number 15 feet high. Is that correct? I thought I saw 17 in the text. Two different standards for two different areas. In the Thousand Oaks area plan, the number is 17 feet. In that instance, it's a prohibition on buildings higher than 17 feet, within 20 vertical feet of a prominent ridgeline designated by the City of Thousand Oaks. In the Scenic Resource Protection Overlay Zone Ordinance Standard, the standard is that if your building exceeds 15 feet in height, a discretionary permit would be required, even if the development is less than 1,000 square feet in area. And the 15 feet is based on the County Zoning Ordinance requirement for accessory structures. That is the height limitation for the residential and open space zones. Okay, thank you. Just a point of clarification. The 15 feet in the case of a pitched roof is at the midpoint of the pitched roof. So the peak could be higher, but the eaves would be lower. Commissioner Wessner? Those of us that have been here before, between the houses on the beach, where is the first floor, and some of the other properties, trust me, if you had trouble with sophomore high school geometry, come to that meeting. It's mind-boggling. Just a couple points of clarification real quick. You had mentioned on, real quick, the new exemption for the view shed, and you showed the one slide where a truck going down the road. Now, is it defined as the center line of that road in the ordinance? I didn't see that. It doesn't say. It says view from the road. View from the road. We went through this at Moore Park in 92, and was it the center line? Was it the side? So just a recommendation there to make a clarification so you don't have a problem down the road where that will be taken from. Typically, we look at it from the road right of way, including the sidewalks that would be, if there are sidewalks on the adjacent. Well, what we ran into is if you were five feet one way or five feet another, when you extended the line out, the issue started rising. It would be from any point within the public right of way. Yeah, so if as much clarity as you can give at the specific point, we'll save you a little headache down the road. Required findings for CPs and PD permits, you were talking about that there would be forward-looking. 
when they came forward. I'm a little concerned about trying to hold somebody to a standard what might happen 20 years down the road. Can you clarify that a little bit for me? The difference between PD and CUP? Right. Just the fact that when we do an analysis, or you would do an analysis, you're going to hold somebody to a standard that may not be existing, and I'm a little concerned about Conditional that. use permits are intended for things like oil permits or mining permits, uh, where they may be perfectly compatible to surrounding land uses at the time they're approved, mm -hmm. but 10 years from now there may be a subdivision in there that, that didn't exist before, mm -hmm. and so that 10 years down the road you may have to reconsider whether that use should be allowed or whether the conditions that were imposed are still appropriate. Um, and, and that's why you do these periodic reviews. Right. Uh, with a plan development permit, uh, periodic reviews aren't aren't necessary to, to meet the standards. The standard simply says you're compatible with existing legally established land uses in the area in the in the area. Okay. All right. I'm just I understand the review process, but I, I'm getting worried about somebody comes from us and we start doing a what ifing up here twenty five years from now when none of us are here and we're trying to hold somebody to that what if standard. So mm -hmm. um, then the last thing is when you did the sign presentation, um, I didn't see anything, and I hopefully I'm correct in this, is that you're, we're not going to get into the style and color palettes and all. Uh, we went through this once before, and the discussion was what's appropriate for the neighborhood, and Ojai is not appropriate for Port Wyneme kind of thing. In, in the case of the sign standard, it's an actual prohibition. It says there will be no sign above that height. It has right. nothing to do with the what's on the sign. Right. But if the sign's under that, then yes. whatever sign ordinance would be applicable. Correct. To, but it wouldn't be a standard countywide. No. Thank you. That's all the questions are. Thank you, Commissioner Weston. I have a couple of questions. First of all, you stated that the Lake Sherwood Community Association and the Lake Sherwood Development Com Company have endorsed these amendments. Is that correct? They have both submitted letters requesting that the area be rezoned. Okay. Thank you. And my last question is, in regard to the Thousand Oaks, recommendations about the 100 foot and the notification are are you thinking about that or is is there any any recommendation on that at this point my instruction was to take it to your commission and let your commission decide if that's an appropriate change we don't have any particular objection to it it would be a simple change to make to the ordinance um, well first of all let me clarify a couple things uh, in Mr. Hawkins' presentation, he, he said that uh, the City of Thousand Oaks was asking for a discretionary permit if it was within 100 feet um, of the boundary of an adjacent uh, property owned by a public agency. That's not the case. They're just simply saying we want notification of any discretionary permit that's within this uh, distance. Um, so first of all, uh, we because, well, first of all, under the guidelines for early development, we send notification to the cities within the, their sphere of influence anytime there's a discretionary permit, and we don't need these policies to do that. If they want a clarification in the Thousand Oaks area plan to this effect, we don't have an objection if your commission wants to add that in. We don't think that we should be making this very special standard of notification in the countywide SRP ordinance just for the city of Thousand Oaks. I would assume there's a reason for that request. And it must be financial. It is financial. The landowner is responsible for clearance within 100 feet of a structure, but if the structure is on another property, the, the Costco would be responsible then for clearing the clearing that, that 100 foot area. So the county, they would want the county to impose a condition on the landowner to pay for clearance of someone else's property? What they really want is, is to be, that there be a permit required, not that it would be exempt for, for other reasons because it's less than a thousand square feet or, or because it can't be seen. They want a permit so that they could approach the landowner and work out an agreement to either relocate the building so it's not within 100 feet, not affecting Costco, or the landowner would sign up an agreement to, to do the 100 foot clearance, uh, relieving Costco of that responsibility. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it's a point of clarification. In the letter, they're not saying they want a discretionary permit for a structure that would otherwise be exempt. What they're saying is they want notification 
for any discretionary permit that is required. They've requested two changes, one change to the ordinance itself and one change to the uh, to the area plan. The area plan would be changed to require notification in that instance. The change to the uh, ordinance would add another exception to when a permit is required for a okay. new structure. Yeah, that was not clear by their letter what, yeah. what exactly, and I assume that you've had follow-up yeah. conversations? Okay, so they're asking, I stand correct, they're asking two different things. One is notification and is policy, but they're also asking that any time um, countywide, uh, in the countywide ordinance, that uh, it provide a notification or that actually require a discretionary permit. In the context of this, would this be for any structure? Any structure within the SRP zone in the Thousand Oak area of interest within 100 feet of a publicly owned designated open space parcel would require a permit under their <laughs> proposal. That is, uh, it's quite a significant change, and it would have to be equally applied to all cities, not just Thousand Oaks. Well, in this case, uh, Thousand Oaks is the only one specifically. I, I, I would also comment on that fact that the, my concern is because the, the brush clearing in open space, this was an issue in the, the large Malibu fire that took place about eight, ten years ago, where the homeowner was caught between the two entities, and the fact that they were ordered to remove within 300 feet, but then the uh, existing ordinance says they can't touch certain habitats and issues. <clears throat> so they were caught in the one of you know widespread fire. So I would also be looking at that issue uh, if there's a protected habitat and one side saying you can't clear and the other side saying you must clear. Meanwhile, the issue of their, their home or whatever property is at risk. And uh, the end result we've, we've seen. So uh, I agree that it's a little more complex than just uh, Give him notification. It appears to me at this point that they would be notified of any discretionary permits, but this other thing is too complicated, I think, at this point. And I would like the commission's opinion do you want to go into this or do you want to let this go back to the planning department and make some recommendations later? Commissioner Weston. My personal feeling is, is we, we have exceptional professional people to make those determinations and develop the matrix and recommendations uh, for us to make an arbitrary or attempt to make a decision. I think it's best that we leave it to the experts to bring back those recommendations to us. Thank you. Any other comments? No, I agree. Then let's, let's let that stand. Any other questions for Mr. Hawkins? Thank you, Dennis. I, please, excuse me. I have a general question uh, regarding agriculture. Existing agriculture and proposed agriculture. It's my understanding if you're going to remove existing agriculture, trees, vineyards, whatever, we don't need a permit under That's the proposal. Correct. Okay. If we're going to plant new great hillsides and plant uh, avocados, vineyards, whatever, what is the process? The standard requires that if you're removing more than a thousand square feet of native vegetation, it would require a discretionary permit. Was there ever a discussion amongst staff exempting ag from this requirement? Yes, we had considerable discussions related to trying to come up with an agricultural exemption. The problem is that uh, we couldn't make a finding that that would result in a less than significant impact because many of the areas near ag are, have significant biological resource impacts and if there's no discretionary permit, there's no opportunity to review that. So there could be visual or biological or other impacts. Um, that would have to be addressed in a, in a probably an environmental impact report. Thank you, sir. The the other thing, just to note, we've it's not a hard and fast definition of what um, let's say uh, what the property owner's intent has been because what we have seen is initially they they have come in and uh, suggested agricultural grading, mm -hmm. and then within a couple of years that becomes the home site. And so it becomes additive, um, and it's hard to make those sorts of distinctions. And um, that's just a practical difficulty of making those sorts of distinctions as to the purpose for which you're doing. It, it really, it, we in the end, it's not the purpose to which you're trying to do the clearance. It's the fact of the clearance and its effect on the visual and biological resources of that area. Thank you. At this point, 
I would like to open the public hearing. Uh, we've had a presentation by the applicant, so I think that's satisfied. We'll go now to the presentation of persons in favor of the requested action. We have about 15 or so speakers. I'd like you to please try to limit your, your presentation to five minutes. And when you come up, would you push those mics close together and state your name and address and bear with me if I mispronounce your names. The first speaker is Dr. Robert Lieberman. The uh, Lake Sherwood Community Association appreciates the opportunity to make comments on the uh, county's uh, scenic uh, resource protection program. Our association represents the homeowners living in the Lake Sherwood uh, existing community and we strongly support the removal of the scenic resource protection overlay designation from our existing community. As Mr. Hawkins has said, the uh, current Lake Sherwood and Sherwood Valley uh, area plan and the <coughs> Lake Sherwood to Hidden Valley area plan contain provisions which protect the scenic resources and the viewshed in our area. Um, many of us, or all of us really, who live in the Lake Sherwood, uh, Sherwood Valley and Hidden Valley areas live there and purchase our property because of the uh, very special and um, unique uh, views and uh, mountains and uh, ability to enjoy those scenic resources. <clears throat> um, we have fought hard over the years, in particular in 1978 when the Dayton Realty Company wanted to put in an 1800 home development in our area that would have significantly uh, intruded upon the scenic resources and our view shed. We fought them very uh, hard and uh, won uh, the, we, we defeated their amendment of the, their proposal for uh, an amendment to the uh, general plan uh, that um, uh, actually was uh, very close. It was a three to two vote on the Board of Supervisors. And so we steadfastly now are in support of the existing protections that we have um, based on the uh, current uh, area plans that are in place. Uh, we, we have two other uh, speakers that you have. Uh, forms for from our community and they might add I think uh, a word or two about this. Thank you Dr. Lieberman. Mr. Hidma, Mr. Hidma and Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore is the next speaker. I'm, I'm calling you in the order that you presented the cards. Yes my name is Mike Moore and my address is 242 Upper Lake Road. As Dr. Lieberman has stated I'm with the Community Association and again, we would like to um, speak in favor of this, of course. And in my, from my perspective, uh, the fact that this was in place over a year ago and trying to develop some very minor projects, as he has been to talk, uh, discussed by Mr. Hawkins, the, the barbecue and so on. We had a, a set of stairs that we wanted to put on an existing deck, and we're told that you know it was a $5,000 deposit to get going, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, from my perspective, and the fact that it had a very injurious effect on the construction activities in our community, um, I would request that you approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Hibma. Uh, my name is Dick Hibma. I live at 152 Lower Lake Road at Lake Sherwood. Um, on my card I said I was in support of GPA 09 003. I should have said the zoning change uh, ZN 09 002. Um, we are strongly in support of Lake Sherwood being exempt from this scenic overlay resource discretionary permit process and I hope that the quotations of existing community means existing community and there isn't something else in that definition. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Good morning. 
This is an old struggle. It goes would way back. It's historical. Would you please state your name oh, sorry. and address? Gail Topping, 1417 Foothill Road, Ojai. Thank you. The struggle goes back historically with the ranchers and the farmers, uh, the public good versus the private interest. It's all historic. And it's through time, philosophers, policies, laws, they've all struggled with the same thing. Some people call it a moral dilemma. What I know living in Ojai Valley is that the SRP revision has goodwill. Goodwill is for the future generations. It's for the public good. It asks every individual to cooperate and co-create, to move out of self-interest into the greater good for all. In Ojai Valley, we've found proposals of this nature to be good for the valley, for tourism, for life in everyday ways, and for the economic uh, goodwill of all. Intrinsically, protecting open space and land use is good for all of us. It certainly slows the damage that is subtly occurring to other counties. The SRP restraints are meant to slow down damage, to preserve and to protect land, and that is good. Now's the time for you to vote for the goodwill that this staff has researched and crafted for the good of all, so that what ought to happen, which is preservation, happens more often. This is the moral and ethical steps for the good of all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Topping. Uh, the last speaker I have in support is George Berg. Hello, my name is George Berg. I uh, am a retired chemical engineer living in the unincorporated part of the Ojai Valley of 1417 Foothill Road. And I'd like to speak in favor of the proposed relaxation of the county zoning ordinance and in favor of the SRP process in general. The Ojai Valley SRP has benefited the Ojai Valley Ridge Lines now for about 15 years. While it needs an update to include the highly visible slopes as well as the ridge lines, it has uh, done a significant amount of protection and prever preserved the viewshed in the Ojai Valley. Unfortunately, we were unable to reach a consensus for the update of the Ojai area plan. I hope sometime in the future we'll be able to do that. Uh, however, in the MAC meeting, there was support for the SRP concept, but there was overwhelming unhappiness and skepticism with the county permitting process in general. One way to improve the credibility of the process is to require permits, discretionary permits, only for items that are demonstrably important to scenic resource protection. And I believe that the proposal by county staff does that by eliminating uh, requirements which are not important to scenic resource protection. For example, eliminating the scenic resource uh, requirements on properties which are not visible from the public uh, properties and public highways. Uh, finally, as a personal experience, this last weekend I drove down to San Diego the back way through a corner of Riverside County and Orange County and San Diego County. And the amount of unrestricted development there is really astounding. And it's a stark reminder of the importance of good planning and scenic resource protection in particular that Ventura County has pioneered in Southern California. In closing, I'd like to say that while private property rights are important, and I, as much as anybody, don't like to have my own property rights inflicted. There are also responsibilities that come with the owning of private property and the responsibilities that government has to stand up for the greater good in the public. And I think that these proposals do that. They're a combination of improvements in existing 
uh, protections and they are a reduction in requirements which have proven to be unnecessary or overly restricted. I think it's good balance and I support the changes. Thank you, Mr. Berg. I was just given one more card in support. Is it, is it Thomas Comber? Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Would you please come up and state your name and address? Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Tom Comber. I'm with Sherwood Development Company. I am here to support the general plan amendment and the zoning change, the grading recommendations, and the verbiage changes in the, in the documents. I'd like to thank the planning department, uh, particularly Mr. Hawkins, for the year and a half of work, the tenuous efforts that he has put forward. I'd also like to point out that the previous general plan amendment that put the SRP in conjunction with the SHP definitely affected Sherwood's ability to produce its product. It affected the existing conditions of approval that Sherwood has. We have all of the lots at Sherwood 100% entitled. The previous, if this, if this SRP amendment is not approved, it definitely takes away the rights that were negotiated and discussed with the county through the years. And I am here to tell you I am in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Comber. Uh, before we take the cards of speakers who are in opposition, I have five question marks. That is, they haven't they've checked both columns or haven't checked either. So I'd like to have these people speak next. John Whitman. Good morning. I could not find the uh, agenda. I'm, I'm John Whitman. I live in 1003 Woodstock Lane, City of Ventura. My wife and I have a property in the Ojai Valley. It's in the San Antonio side of the Ojai Valley, and it is a 330-acre ranch. Uh, I did not see the agenda. I did not know of this meeting. Uh, I may be remiss in that, that uh, I may have overlooked the card, or the card did not give this specific date. Uh, I don't know because I don't I don't have that information and further I don't really read the star I don't consider it a very good publication um, so uh, um, my wife and I as I said own uh, a ranch 330 acres we're uh, at present we're allowed to develop that into 40 uh, acre um, uh, properties separate properties as I understand it we do not have any intent of doing that uh, uh, but it gives us value over and above the aggregate land in itself. Um, uh, I, I have concerns that we are, uh, this, the SRPs are enacting uh, statutes that are to the benefit of some people at the cost of others. So that some people are receiving benefit and, and that is costing us. And that bothers me on a, on a social aspect. The, the loss that we may receive out of these SRP, changes in the SRP might be the loss of building a, a, a structure, uh, one of those four possible, three or four possible houses that we could build on our property. It might be a loss in value. Therefore, we have been, something has been taken from us and we receive no compensation for that. And I'm, I'm concerned about that. And that goes back to, this gentleman knows much more about it than I do, I'm not an attorney, but it goes back to the Fifth Amendment and subsequent laws since that period. So I'm concerned that if, if you're asking us to, or demanding that we give up value that our property has, then I'm very, very concerned about that as well. Uh, we have a great investment in this piece of property. Um, uh, the uh, ag development. I, I, I was. We have we have the idea of of putting in a vineyard at the very top of our property, which is at the top of Sulphur Mountain. What is native vegetation? Grass. I think was, I think there should be some clarification of that. I, I understand this is discretionary. I understand that there's there's uh, statutes to protect the oak trees. We would have no intent of, of removing oak trees, but we might be stopped in another way, even though it's outside of the viewshed. 
So I have I have a lot of concerns about this, and I think that this should be postponed, and I think it should, that more public input should be received. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. The next speaker is James. Is this Menzies? Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, sir. And council mem or commission members. Uh, my name is James Menzies. I uh, have property located at Star Route 1, Box 175, Maricopa Highway, Maricopa, California, 93252. Uh, we're engaged in, in uh, organic farming. And as you brought up the issue with respect to uh, what constitutes uh, things that can be done with respect to uh, agriculture. I, I have a couple of serious issues here. One, in, do, in doing organic farming, we leave a portion of the grounds fallow for a period of time rather than putting them in production every single year. And it precludes the depletion of a lot of the natural resources in the soil. So when you eliminate the ability to clear, quotes, brush, brush is what again occurs on that ground once it's been left fallow uh, and then to require us to go back in and uh, uh, procure a permit for refarming the same ground that we farmed in the past over years. Uh, we've owned the property up there since 1953 and have had it in, in and out of production for many, many, many years. Um, the other issue I'd like to bring up is the uh, issue of fire clearance that you touched upon here. What is an endangered plant? What isn't? Uh, we went through the Zaka fire, the day fire, and I can ma name another multiplicity of fires that we've had in that area. I'd like to point out that our f closest fire response is Ojai 5, which on a day like today where the road is closed, they won't respond. Uh, anytime we've had to have emergency fire response up there, it's come from a a multiplicity of different agencies and we can't count on on a, on a rapid response. As a result, 100 feet of clearance in many locations is not adequate. We have to clear 300 feet or uh, if we're in a condition like the winds from the Zaka fire, those sparks are moving 1,500 feet in a matter of just a, a few minutes. So I'd like you to reconsider that issue and, and come up with something that will work for uh, the agricultural interests up there as well. Uh, I too would like to point out that the restrictions on anything that we're able to do uh, farming uh, wise or otherwise on that property is a taking without compensation. But I think uh, Mr. Hawkins and, and the other members of his organization have done an outstanding job in trying to melt these issues as he has together to make them workable in our community. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Menzi. The next speaker is Ken Hahn. Good morning. My name is Ken Hahn. I live at 2427 Teeland Avenue in Santa Maria. Um, myself and my family have owned uh, a piece of property in the Cuyama Valley uh, that Highway 33 uh, abuts and goes through. We've paid taxes for over 35 years on that property. I'm not a rich man. It, I had to sweat blood and tears to pay for that property. And these restrictions are giving me the right to pay taxes but not the right to enjoy it. And I too would like to farm and maybe someday build a home. But I, I feel like these restrictions have just taken my property away. I would like for you to thoroughly consider what you're doing and put yourself in other people's places. Please do that. Please consider that. Put yourself in someone else that owns that land. So many times I've got my attitude. I don't care about anyone else. Please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hahn. 
The next speaker is Douglas Sullivan. I'm kind of, my name is uh, Douglas Sullivan. I live at 69 Upper Lake Road in Lake Sherwood, California. I'm kind of one of those hybrid people up here. I'm, I'm for, the, for the new revision and I'm also opposed to what happened in October of 08. Um, I think it's great what you're doing for Lake Sherwood. The local developer and our local association have done a great job uh, trying to combat this ordinance that was revised in October of 08. Um, I think it was ridiculous that nobody was notified of that original revision. There was a small little ad in the paper because it was over a thousand property owners. But um, what happened was we now have this burdensome, or burdensome ordinance that allows you to get $5,000 for a barbecue or anything above two feet tall in my backyard. Uh, most of the time, the, the project is less than what the permit costs. Um, so I'm against the SRP zone as it applies to Sherwood, but I'm also against it how it applies to other people all over the county. It's not just a Sherwood thing, it's a whole county thing. I think we're all for open space. I think we're all for protecting the hillsides. But the county's gone too far in this most recent revision. Um, also, by requiring PD permits in, the, in these SRP zones, you're, the county will become out of compliance with the housing element of the general plan. You're using general plan zoning and, and designating all these lots all over the county for your housing element for affordable housing, second guess housing units. Uh, AB 1867 stated that all guest houses in the state of California shall be ministerial. By applying this SRP zone and requiring a plan development permit, you are making it a discretionary in violation of state law, and you also might be out of compliance with the housing element of the general plan. So that should be reviewed. Also, it should be reviewed if, if the SRP zone is being applied equally to everybody in the areas that it, that it is. So I'm for it as it applies to my property in Sherwood, but I'm, I would like to see it rolled back in the rest of the county. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, David Magny. My name is David Magny. I represent the California Native Plant Society. I live in Ojai at 110 West Matillaha Street, Apartment D. Um, I'm, like the previous speaker, I have um, some problems with what's proposed. I also support what's proposed. I, I really appreciate streamlining our regulations, making them as simple as, as um, they can be to be followed and make for them to make sense. Uh, some of my concerns are about, one, the lack of CEQA analysis on impacts to biological resources, since I'm representing the California Native Plant Society. Um, there was really no assessment of impacts uh, of the changes in particular, what I'm focusing on is exemptions to like fuel modification plans. Um, the, the, a fuel modification plan has the, the result of removing the vegetation from that plan area uh, and there is no environmental review of the impacts of that vegetation removal. Um, the, the county suggested that the, that's the responsibility of the fire department who prepares those plans. Well, in fact, when I looked into it, every single uh, area plan that the fire department did, they exempted. So there was absolutely no review of impacts on the environment at all. They just exempted it. And that's a problem. So they're, the county is saying, well, we can exempt this because somebody else is going to take responsibility for it. That other person didn't take responsibility for it. So there's a loophole. I'd like that closed. I want to make sure that the impacts are truly addressed. Um, that's our primary consideration. Uh, again, we, prove, we, we want to make sure that any actions from this overlay zone uh, properly assesses impacts on the environment and that certain things aren't exempted. We want equity in that area. That's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Magny. Uh, we now have speakers. Uh, and we have quite a few speakers who are opposed to the recommendation. Again, I'd like you to limit your time, please. And if, if you're repeating something that someone else has already stated, that's fine, too. But it just prolongs this a little bit. Uh, 
I was handed a card just now for someone who supports the recommendation, so I'll, I will take that at this point. John Fonte. Thank you, Chair. Uh, John Fonte, Thousand Oaks. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that I'm not direct. Oh, 4760 via Don Luis, Thousand Oaks. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that I'm not directly affected by the proposed change in the, in the law. I don't own one of the properties that are affected. But I am indirectly affected, as is thousands of other residents in the area. Uh, I live near Hidden Valley, Ventu Park, Sherwood Valley. Um, when I take walks in my community, I look at the scarred ridgelines where some residents have adopted a king of the hill mentality. Uh, these homeowners have little consideration for the plebes of the valley. They clear cut the hillside and they put up unnecessary eyesores like hundreds of feet of bright white fencing which can be seen for miles. There's absolutely no bona fide reason for some of it. One can get the same result without visual degradation by using materials which blend into the landscape. It's too bad that legislation of this type even has to be considered, but as president of an HOA, I can see regularly that some people just don't care about their neighbors and, and the community at all. They live in a vacuum. Some even protest when their own neighbors propose doing what they indeed either have done or want to do. I've read the report and I support staff's recommendations. So all I can say is let's put the brakes to the few bad apples who believe that because they own the mountain they can do whatever they want. I don't want Ventura County to start looking like parts of Orange and San Diego counties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fonte. All right, we will now get into the cards, I speakers I have who oppose the recommendation. The first is Tim Cohen. Good morning, uh, Tim Cohen, 3700 Piru Canyon Road, Piru. Uh, my family owns and operates and pays taxes on 2,500 acres within the SRP zone surrounding Lake Piru. I find the SRP overly burdensome on our property, and I want to just give you one example of what this overlay means to us. We've been studying weather patterns and analyzing soil compatibility for a variety of new plantings within the zone, some of it requiring confidentiality agreements, and some of it, those agreements are due to market conditions. These plantings may cause the removal of perennial or annual grassland as the ground is not currently in production. So here's the process. I am to make an application to the planning director identifying what I want to plant, disclosing either confidential or proprietary information. Then wait for seven weeks on average while paying $3,724 for an answer. And again, these are the averages. I usually have to pay two times that fee in private processing permits or, or grading plans or answering anything else the county has. While this is going on, I've made financial commitments to start propagation, risking either a significant amount of time or money. So tell me, how would I make a public application in a restricted private transaction? I can't. This stifles innovation and takes away my ability to grow. Farming is a global business. This put me, puts me at a disadvantage to almost any competitor, even my neighbor down the road. Why would anyone make an investment under these rules? I have read the planning response on page 102 regarding the exemption for farming. In summary, it advised that an EIR would be necessary to, to properly disclose the potential effects. My question is, why would an EIR not be required to measure the effects of the SRP? it has a significant negative impact on me. I would urge you to recommend an exemption for agricultural uses and seriously consider re requesting that to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. The next speaker is Deborah Tash. Deborah Tash, 5777 Balcom Canyon Road, SOMIS, Citizens Alliance for Property Rights, I want to tell you a story about Terry York. Terry York has 27 acres in White, Can uh, White Stallion Ranch. He wanted to dig an agricultural well. 
city of Thousand Oaks that maintains the street came to him and said, we don't want the water running down into the ditch for your 24-hour mandatory well pump test. We want you just to create a little shallow catch basin and you'll be able to then cover it up. Mr. York complied. He's in the process of building his home. He's got a pool scheduled to be put in. He had a greenhouse and a gate. And he wanted this ag well so he can cultivate a portion of his property. He was cited by the county of Ventura for disturbing the earth, maybe 3,000 square feet. He had to hire an environmental company out of Santa Barbara for over $5,000 to study the seeds that he disturbed. Now Mr. York's project, except for this home, is on hold. Can't put in his pool, can't put in his greenhouse, and he cannot put in his gate. He has to ha ask the county of Ventura before Christmas if he could post a bond so that the pool company's employees would not be laid off for lack of work. The county refused. This is the kind of regulation that harms agriculture and harms the property owner. Mr. York bought his property with a pad already on. But he would have had to go through the discretionary use project process if he had no pad, if he had no clearing. It is detrimental to the property owner and agriculture in this county. And what we're asking for is that, though this is a beginning, these rollback of ridiculous restrictions, we're asking that the stakeholders, the people that actually own property, come to the table and tell you their problems and to roll back the SRP even more. I'm sorry the gentleman doesn't like white fences. Some people think they're pastoral and beautiful. The eye, it is, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And to have your community and neighbors continually telling you what's beautiful is wrong. Only because you as the county are there to help us with safety and and ma uh, maintaining health, and in, in a collective kind of way, maintaining roads, things that we can't do individually. But when you get into aesthetics, when you get into ridiculous re regulations that hamper somebody from clearing weeds, then you've gone far enough. It's like being on a rack and being tortured. You got it notched up to 10, and you roll it back to seven, and you say, you feel better? Actually, I don't. You won't let me off the rack, but at least let me be in the negotiations to roll back a few more notches. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cash. Uh, next speaker, Larry Mosler. Larry Mosler, 2280 Moon Ridge Avenue, Newberry Park. I bought my property, 16 acres of raw land on the side of the hill overlooking the entire Caneo Valley in 1976. I went up there, cleared the land, built my house, built my property, done all of this, and then since 1976, I watched the Caneo Valley just grow all of the lights, all of the different colors, the white buildings, the brown buildings, all the different buildings that everybody on the flatland approved and wanted. Now, I have 75% more visual blight as what I might say is there that I have to look at. Then we have our nice people who just come into town because they're tired of living in L.A. or someplace, 
now I got in to good Ventura County or Thousand Oaks. I got my share. Now let's lock the door and nail it shut. I don't want to let anybody else come in and partake in what I finally got. Then they are right there to sit down in the valley and look up at me and say, Oh, I don't like what he's doing up there, so I'm going to take and protest. I'm going to get some environmental group. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. But I, he, I have to stop him because he doesn't have the right. I have to look at him. When Linda Parks drives over the canal grade and she looks up on the hill and says, My God, I don't want to see anything up there. This guy or that guy, he cleared some brush. This is an eyesore. I tell Linda Parks, don't look. <laughs> Everything that is, well, as soon as you hit the canal grade, you can see everything on the side of that mountain. I won't be able to do anything on my property without spending thousands of dollars of taking and hiring consultants and fighting the illustrious planning department. This planning department is out of control. You go and I would love to have you take and apply for a permit and send it through the planning department. See how much money and how much time and aggravation you will have on some little individual permit. Join the crowd. Join what we are fighting. If any of you look back at the most important document that this country has, the first three words of this document start out saying, we the people. We the people are being screwed by government. Look at the state of California, the mess that the state has. All of the do-gooders imposing all these rules, regulations that are killing jobs, they're killing everything. If you want my property, you write out a check for fair market value and you know what? I'll cash it if it's good. I'll cash it and then I'm going to get the hell out of California because I'm sick of it. I'm sick of the government taking my rights from me on the grounds. It's good for the people. Guess what? I'm the people too. Don't forget, I am the people. We are the people. We the people are going to take back control of our lives and our government. Look at dear old Boston, Massachusetts, what happened Tuesday. Thank you. Let's please let everyone speak their piece, but let's have order. Thank you, Mr. Mosler. Uh, the next speaker I have is Marvin Ray. My name is Marvin Ray, and I farm in the Cuyama Valley. Uh, we farm in San Luis, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. We have 240 acres in Ventura County, and. We feel that it's a mass excuse, restriction. Excuse me, Mr. Ray. May we have your address to? What's that? May, may we have your address? Three zero eight zero zero Maricopa Highway, Maricopa, California. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Please continue. We're basically not in Maricopa. We're in the northern uh, ten miles of Ventura County, the northeastern corner of Ventura County. It's in the Cuyama Valley. It's the upper ten miles of Cuyama Valley which looks totally different than any property you have down here. And uh, the, the whole basic Cuyama Valley is farmed, and the farming does continue up into Ventura County, and uh, the last 10 miles of it there, there. And we feel that to have to get a discretionary permit to clear any of our property to expand a farming operation or make it more efficient to farm, it would be a, a, 
absolutely ridiculous and expense to do any type of development work and uh, I think it it drastically decreases the value of your property because the property is the only value you have up there there's no other businesses there's probably 10 people that live on a stretch of road uh, in 10 miles it's very unpopulated it's agriculture it's grazing and farming and uh, to, to, to have grading permits and clearing restrictions like this is, is just ridiculous and um, I think that uh, we should be notified more uh, a better in a better way than what we're being notified we have never gotten any notifications of any of this SRP zoning since night since it started in the 80s uh, we hear about it after the fact uh, I don't know what newspaper you're publishing it in we don't get any letters on it we don't get any publications on it we, we don't know any of this any of these uh, hearings happen until after they're done um, I also feel that those 10 miles shouldn't be in a scenic protection zone at all it is not scenic it's in the bottom of a canyon your view is from 0 to 100 feet on one side of the road and maybe a quarter mile on the other what you're looking at is a dry riverbed nothing but sand and rock the mountain on the other side is about four or five hundred feet high it's a narrow canyon there is no view you're not up on top of the mountain like going over highway 33 in a national forest it doesn't look anything like that and um, I feel that that the uh, they have SRP zoning on the private land through there that the private lands probably cover 80% of the highway frontage in that area and you have the whole national forest from Ozena Ranger Station clear to uh, Oakview is a national forest that is scenic that uh, uh, I understand why you're doing what you're doing with with that property and that zoning in that area but in the Cuyama Valley I don't think it is it's totally different uh, uh, climate it's a totally different area it's a high desert type area there's very little vegetation it's, it's not scenic and uh, I, I feel that these restrictions are are out of line thank you thank you mr. Ray uh, the next speaker is uh, Lynn Jensen Thank you. My name is Lynn Jensen. I'm with Jensen Design and Survey. Our address is 1672 Donlin Street in Ventura. Um, okay, my name is Lynn Jensen. I work for Jensen Design and Survey, Inc. We do permit processing uh, for many of the particularly farming clients in the county. Um, I'm at 1672 Donlin Road in Ventura. I would actually like to thank the planning staff, particularly Dennis Hawkins, uh, for his tireless explanations of the proposed language and amendments in the SRP. We've had uh, quite a bit of conversation. Um, and I think his purpose was to try to balance this regulation here um, at the request of the Board of Supervisors. My goal was to test the rules out to make sure that they um, protect something, that there is actually something of value they're protecting and not just a regulation for its own sake, which creates frustrations for our applicants. I think the language is certainly an improvement over the, uh, the previous amendment. The problem for me is looking at the original ordinance crafted in the 1980s and 90s, which were in response to a few cases of poor decisions by landowners. While the original intent was to protect the viewshed of truly scenic lakes, and beaches and highways with respect to undeveloped ridges, over time the restrictions uh, have been expanded to include many questionable urban and rural areas like Lake Sherwood and Ventu Park. These areas were subdivided for development a long time ago and they're not necessarily on the ridge tops and they really have no purpose being in the SRP. 
In my mind, the environmental community sees the opportunity to classify all property owners as villains who need to be strictly controlled. But the question is not really environmental at all in the SRP. The main question is, why would property owners building a house which is allowed by right on their property be subject to a biology review just because they can be seen by a public road? Anyone in this audience who's been through the CEQA permit process, and there are many, know how out of control it is with respect to the cost and the red tape for any size project. It's fraught with catch-22s and decisions that totally lack common sense because of the regulations and the way they've been written. The system is set up to punish property owners, and they really don't protect any resources because there's an agenda, I think, rather than science, cooking up a lot of these supposed resources, particularly in the cases of biology and the refusal to allow newer sewage treatment options for property owners. And I think there's a lack of believability in some of the biology that's coming across based on regional studies and not really based on studies that are specific to Ventura County. I defy you to show me a detailed biology study to support some of the newest sky is falling restrictions. Again, I think the value is overstated and there's a lack of confidence in property owners that the restrictions that are coming down really protect anything. In fact, the SRP is not an environmental issue, and it's not health and safety related. It's the public seeking to control what a private person can build by right on his or her property. And we found that in opposing this kind of regulation, the coalition supporting the SRP includes, of course, the environmental lobby, but also a lot of property owners who have built their houses already, and they don't want to have anyone else here. They want to restrict others from the same right. And we've received letters from people, and we've Googled their addresses and found that they really are sitting up on top of a ridgetop, and they don't want anyone else to build. The problem here is that long ago, the government allowed the sale of these properties, they allowed the subdivision of the properties, and they're collecting property taxes every single year for the right for people to eventually build. And now, these regulations severely complicate the rights of people to build on their property. So I ask myself why. Why would there be such opposition to the American dream of a house with a view in the countryside, maybe including an orchard or a vineyard? And the answer that I found and that I've been finding from some of the board members is that there's an agenda of a few who call all of these houses McMansions. The truth is there is no McMansions in open space because the definition of a mansion is a large house overbuilt for the lot. And the minimum lot size in open space is 10 acres. Um, these houses are not McMansions, they're well lived in, they're family homes, and they're not trophy homes like you see in some of the resort areas. They're built so that families can get together from all parts of the country, most people are spread around, and they can accommodate their families. They have ranches, they have horses, it's the country lifestyle. And even the smallest 10 acre lot out there in open space leaves nine and a half acres open by general plan ordinance. You're only allowed 5% lot coverage. You can only build a half an acre on a 10 acre lot. And that is why you see all this open space here. It's not because of SOAR or all these other things. It's because of the general plan, which is already in effect. And while the grading and building of these houses causes an immediate visual disturbance, it really disappears rather quickly with um, the uh, vis with the screening and the planting, and over time, these houses recede into the background. So I have three recommendations to make to this. I believe this is an overreaction, and it's a failed argument to support a failed agenda. My three recommendations are one, stop the spread of this kind of regulation and combine this discriminatory policy to the viewshed of truly outstanding scenic properties, scenic lakes, beaches, and highways with respect to undeveloped ridge tops. Right now, there's, there's, this is an effect on developed ridge tops, and it's an effect in places that are truly are not scenic. And the removal of the developed Lake Sherwood property is a good start. I believe that Ventu, Ventu Park should really be next. And I also uh, recommend that you change the document to allow an exemption for grading and clearing brush for agricultural planting. Why would you stop a property owner from planting orchards or vineyards on, on their property in an agricultural county like ours. It doesn't make any sense. The tree ordinance already protects areas with mature trees, thereby protecting the county's oak woodlands, which is, I believe, what you're trying to do. There's enough layers of bureaucracy here. 
And the second, the third thing that I would, I would do is increase the minimum grading and clearing area allowed within the SRP to 4,000 square feet from 1,000 square feet to allow at least an average size house to be built there without having to go through this whole CEQA process. I think 1,000 square feet is too small. Only the wealthiest owners are able to afford the PD permit process, and I think that definitely discriminates against those of lesser means. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jensen. The next speaker, Kurt Johnson. Good morning. My name is Kurt Johnson, 240 Feliz Drive, Oakview. I have a, uh, my wife and I have a 16 acre ranch there. We uh, try to grow avocados, although in the last few years we found that that's uh, very difficult to do without any water. But uh, that's another story, <laughs> not for your concern right now. Uh, I can, many of the things that I was going to talk about have already been addressed by previous speakers, so I won't waste time repeating it. Um, I would just like to reinforce the uh, point that uh, the whole permitting, permitting process in this county is uh, way out of control. It's uh, way too lengthy, way too expensive, uh, way too vague. Uh, you never know uh, what they're going to, when you go in to get a permit, you never know what they're going to hit you with next. You know, you think you think you finally got over one hurdle and then they say, oh, and by the way, you got to you know get this environmental impact study or you know have a helicopter fly over and take pictures or you know some other crazy thing like that and you know the it's i've heard some horror stories about people trying to get uh, permits to do anything here and it's just unbelievable i mean it's like you want to stop everything from happening in the county and uh you know it's just not fair you're supposed to be uh helping the people in the county not uh not hurting them, and I really think you're hurting them in agriculture, most in particular. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, owned and operated a, a farming operation or an orchard, but uh, it's really difficult. Uh, there's so many agencies uh, in, at all levels of government, uh, local, county, state, federal, that are constantly after you to, with uh, rules and restrictions and filling out forms and and uh, and they just keep bribing you with this stuff all the time and it gets to the point where you you just want to give up you say it's not worth it I mean here in this country we produce the best food in the world and all we're trying to do is put food on your table and you know you, it seems like why do you hate us why are, why are you trying to make this so difficult like I said you just want to give up. And, uh, you know, I kind of wish that I had never moved to Ventura County and if I had realized all the ridiculous rules and restrictions and regulations that you have here that make it so difficult, I would have seriously considered not ever planning on spending the rest of my life in Ventura County, even though it's a beautiful place. But beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And why some people think that a hillside of manzanita and, and poison oak is prettier than a hillside of orchards or strawberries, I don't get that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, the next speaker, Pat Baggerly. Good morning, Chairman Molitor and members of the Commission. I'm Pat Baggerly for the Environmental Coalition. Excuse you me, have, um, Mrs. Live, Baggerly, excuse me, would you give us your address, please? I live at 119 South Poli Avenue, Miners Oaks. Thank you very much. Generally, saying, you know, the name of the organization is sufficient, so um, no one's required that you go into your address necessarily at a public hearing. But I don't mind telling where I live. I live in Miners Oaks, and I was happy to merge my property uh, when we first moved here in 1976. A lot of people in the Ojai Valley, for the good of everybody, merged small properties together so that there wouldn't be overcrowding and cause a lot of environmental problems. Um, but I am not one of the larger property owners. 
so in the packet you have our letters. I hope you've read them. Uh, I know I've been here twice before this commission on this topic, but we have a new member, so I hope you had time to read the Environmental Coalition letter and the responses. So I won't go over that again with you. I brought a uh, policy forum on landscape aesthetics and public policy. It was published by the American Land Forum magazine in the spring of 1983, and I'm just going to read a small portion of this. The rationale for taking beauty seriously lies deep in our traditions. Plato argues that the statesman should be most concerned about beauty, for its power to contribute to the health and order of society is great. This, he says, is because delight in beauty flows from the ability to perceive and value harmony, a quality which is of utmost value for a society which desires to remain stable and at peace. Thomas Jefferson shared that perception when he wrote that communities should be planned with an eye to the effect made on the human spirit by being surrounded with beauty instead of ugliness. His design for the city of Washington put congressional offices comfortably next to the president's home along the Potomac, manifesting his sense that architectural harmony would reflect and build political harmony in the new nation. President Lyndon Johnson cited for Congress the fact that squalid conditions degrade the daily lives of citizens, while association with beauty enlarges the imagination and revives the human spirit. Landscape, in short, inextricably affects us, shaping our behavior and identity, dulling or sharpening our sense of what can be. So the Environmental Coalition really supports the scenic resource protection overlay zone. Uh, it has a couple of exceptions, which you can find in our letter related to the clearing. And also, uh, we believe that to keep the conditional use permit for discretionary projects is something this commission supported before. And we think it's good, it, it doesn't apply to any residences, although some people are alluding that it does. It, all the residential uses you excluded and you only have non-residential uses like oil production and things like that, which I think needs more oversight. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Baggerly. Uh, and thank you for your letters, too. And I did read them. Uh, next speaker is Ron. Is it Coors? Ron? I'm chairman, uh, members of the commission. My name is Ron Coons, uh, Coons and Bajan Engineering Incorporated. 4685 East Industrial Street, Simi Valley. I want to thank the uh, commission and the staff for uh, a lot of hard work that they put in on this project. Um, I think it was well intended, but uh, I also want to echo uh, Ms. Uh, Lynn Jensen's comments, so I won't repeat those, but I strongly uh, believe all of those comments were accurate. With regards to uh, the ridge lines, I think it would be well if those ridge lines were uh, clearly depicted on a map and kept the building areas out of that visual depiction where those ridge lines are so there's no confusion amongst staff or the public as to what other minor uh, ridges or minor landforms might exist that might uh, be confused as one of these major ridge lines that are of concern. I also want to know if uh, any new areas are going to be proposed, if those areas are going to be required to be uh, included as an area plan that might also have to be following all of these SRP guidelines. I, I think the notification process to all those people and any other types of properties that might be included in the future could be uh, greatly impacted and at the property owner's detriment. With regards to uh, the, the area plans, it, it says these areas as determined by an area plan is different than the areas depicted in the uh, mapping of the scenic resource area. I, I would think that the area plans also should 
depict them by uh, visual graphics on, on documents rather than just verbiage so it be clearly understood. With regards to the uh, area that's uh, exempt of the thousand square feet, that's basically a 32 foot square pad that uh, you'd be able to build and have an exemption. Uh, again, that's if it was 4,000 or 5,000, that'd be 65 foot square pad, which is not a significant impact any more than a thousand square foot pad that you're talking about. I think uh, having the ability to build up to a, a 4,000 square foot home is very reasonable. And I think uh, limiting it to the thousand square feet is, is not reasonable. Also, I think there would be uh, well to include in the, the ordinance document some visual graphics that would show the clearance that would be allowed to be done around such a building of a home or a structure. And I think that uh, those clearances around the home should be coordinated with the Regional Water Quality Control Board, the uh, Corps of Engineers, Fish and Game, any other agencies that might come about later and say that there's a conflict so the homeowner that might or the property owner that might be wanting to build would see uh, in this ordinance that he has uh, an exemption and can proceed along that line and then later find out that there's some other agency that might not uh, believe that's true and again uh, I want to depict uh, the cost of these permits on discretionary permits I've worked with many property owners. Uh, uh, I've got a couple major property owners I'm working with now that have uh, hundreds and even thousands of acres that uh, um, we think that this is not a good move to uh, just perpetuate the SRP that was developed many years ago. I think we should go back and uh, relook at the basics of the SRP and and uh, renew that effort rather than just modify this and keep moving forward. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. Coons. The next speaker, Dennis Mitchum. Good morning, my name is Dennis Mitchum. I live at 4488 Thatcher Road, Ojai, California. I'm the manager of a company that um, that owns over 4,800 acres in the uh, in Ventura County. Um, this company, we've owned the property for over 30 years. It's had a variety of agricultural uses on it. When you're in the agricultural business, you need to be flexible, be able to move quickly, change crops, exp drill a well, retrofit an existing well, grade a road for access to a well. Current current regulations um, under the uh, scenic resource protection overlay um, really hinder our ability to operate and be economically successful, which is to the benefit of the entire county. Uh, I appreciate the effort of the staff and the commission to remove the current barriers uh, to economic development and responsible land use. The proposed language doesn't go far enough to uh, relieve the and reduce the governmental micromanagement of our private property. Um, I suggest that the um, the brush area removal be in increased in th to the order of five to ten thousand square feet, and that there be exceptions for agricultural grading and planting. Um, and really that, that the staff be directed and the commission to consider as they address these issues, the economic benefit and how that also is helpful to everyone in the county. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mitchum. The next speaker, Matt, Checo.
Thank you for saying my name correctly. I won one. My name is Matt DiCecco. I live at 678 East Carlisle Road in an old home built in 1947 and a few outbuildings. I've got six acres out there. And um, on your Exhibit 5 for the Lake Sherwood area, I'm in the green section. And I was hoping I could be put into the yellow section, areas to be removed. Uh, I am a homeowner of a single family home. As I said, it was built in 1947. It's fallen down. It's wonderful, but it needs upgrading. I uh, took two and a half years to get a permit, first to make it a legal lot and then to get uh, my power lines put underground. I think that's a beautification thing. I don't think anybody would be opposed to that. But it took me forever and it cost me tons. Um, I'm opposed to additional burdens on me as a single family homeowner to comply with more rules. And I agree that Sherwood should be removed from the SRP restrictions, but I also live in a community on a what I believe is a beautiful road but I don't know if it's a scenic road I'm in a valley I can't be seen by the lake I have no hills and I have to go with all the new rules and regulations I think I'm a very responsible steward of the land and I hope to continue to care for it keep it natural and beauty beautiful for my family and my community so I am opposed to it how it is now and I hope to be excluded from it so thank you thank you Mr. Checo the next speaker is Elaine Crank good morning my name is Elaine Crankle I live at 10409 Santa Ana Road in Ventura California I reside in the Ojai Valley I have a 205 acre ranch next to Lake Casitas, which is fortunate for me, or rather possibly unfortunate. Most of my property can be seen from um, roadways, so it greatly restricts what we can do up there. We um, own and run a very high end small production winery. We bought the property for agricultural production. We have recently gone through the, um, excuse me, I'm nervous. We went through the CUP process to get permission to build a processing facility on the property. It took us over two years and a couple hundred thousand dollars to achieve that. So when people talk a couple hundred thousand, I've offered to Mr. Bennett that we would open our books for him so he sees what that really entails. That may not be direct cost to the county, but if you start hiring consultants to get through the process, it's very, very expensive. Um, when you start the process, there's a lot that's required of you up front to even get an application on the counter. If people knew what it takes and the reality of it, I think that they may not invest in this county. Um, I think that we're turning into a, a country of consumers. You're restricting people's ability to produce in this country, and I think it's unjust and unfair. I think that the Sherwood plan should be rolled back. I think that there's um, discrimination in the process. and. Uh, most of the other things I feel have already been stated, but I'm happy to open any of our books for you if you want to see the reality of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crankle. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Wayne Fishback. Good morning. I'm Wayne Fishrek, uh, resident of Simi Valley, 3106 Calusa Avenue. And uh, a lot of the things have been said that I was going to say, but I'd like to uh, talk specifically about the uh, grading. Um, I believe that um, the uh, grading that's in this ordinance is contrary to the uh, building code. Uh, the building code uh, controls uh, earthwork construction, and grading is, is basically a construction process. And so uh, this should not be allowed to usurp the uh, grading code. I think you're also aware that the grading code is in the process of being uh, rewritten, and so this grading will be coming up for uh, review through the grading code uh, review. The um, SRP restrictions also 
prevent our uh, agricultural people from doing uh, agriculture by right. ESRP uh, restrictions prevent us from uh, doing maintenance, storm damage as we're suffering right now. We would have to go in and get uh, discretionary permits just to uh, maintain and repair our land. The grading restrictions uh, also have a significant ad adverse effect on uh, CEQA issues if you're brought into that. The um, CEQA issues, for example, list such things as water resources. If you do terracing of land, that basically can conserve water, which is a beneficial thing. The uh, surface uh, water quality and quantity are both affected also by erosion control, terracing, those sorts of things. Agricultural resources such as soils, the loss of soil, that's a detrimental impact if you're restricted from doing certain types of grading. Seismic hazards, property that I have, we have large boulders, landslides, those sorts of things. Stabilization has to take uh, place. All of that comes under the uh, building code, by the way. Also, uh, private roads and driveways, those have to be maintained on agricultural properties. And the list goes on. So I think that this is more about these aesthetic issues than what are real issues related to construction and those types of activities. I have some documents that I'd like to submit uh, for the record with the commission. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fishback. All right, we have two more speakers, and then we'll take a, uh, about a 10-minute break before the uh, applicant has a chance for a rebuttal. The second last speaker is Mark Brazil. My name is Mark Brazil. I uh, live at 1970 Ranch Road. Um, I guess I'm in the minority when I say that I've, I've had a fairly, you know, fairly easy time getting permits for my property. Um, but I know that the discretionary permits are going to put a lot of roadblocks in my way in the future, and it, it does take a lot of time and it does take a lot of money to make these changes. I'm also kind of confused about brush clearance because I thought brush clearance was for the benefit of stopping fires in this, you know, undeveloped area. Um, I know that there's some people, they want this property that, that's along the ridge line. And they want it undeveloped and, you know, there's eminent domain. If, if the county wants it, they can kind of buy it from these people including me. Um, the last thing I want to say is considering how I came from New York, yeah, and uh, considering how everybody drives here, I think people should spend less time looking at the scenery and more time on the road. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brazil, for that levity. Uh, and the last speaker I have is John Beard. John Bird. Pardon me. That's all right. Uh, I'd like to reiterate and go along with just about the concerns that everyone has spoken today, both emotionally and factually. However, I, I understand Excuse why me, Sherwood Bird. is happy to Excuse be me, Mr. with John. I would be happy to be with John. Mr. Bird, before you begin, uh, would you state your address, please? Oh, 21 LeCam, uh, Newbury Park. Thank you. Thank you. I own... Uh, and control numerous parcels up there that were graded back in 1984. Uh, what I was uh, saying is that I can agree with White Stallion. I believe it should, I mean, with uh, Sherwood, it should be withdrawn. But uh, under that same guideline, I would have to say I think White Stallion Ranch should be withdrawn. I think that anybody that developed a property prior to this ordinance going to be enacted, if it does be enacted, should be withdrawn from the plan. But I have a couple specifics. We have a 17 foot height limitation on a home. Being able to be viewed from any road artery in the county. 
if I recall correctly on a, new, a different plan or the plan prior to this one, we had a scenic highway which was Lynn Road. And your staff member used a graph to show this commission what they were going to be looking at. And in fact, uh, Commissioner Weiser was concerned about five foot left or right. That is incorrect. That's giving you a false idea of what you're going to be looking at. If you're looking at anything coming over Caneo grade, that's going to apply. And I would advocate that the 17 foot limitation should be withdrawn completely. If you're looking from Canal Grade or even Lynn Road and you're building a 17 foot high home, which I think is 20 if you take the calculation, and you go back to the regular ordinance which I think is 28 or 32, and you're 2,000 foot away, that is going to shrink the size of that home. And this is a satisfaction for whom? It sure isn't for me as a property owner or a future home purchaser. This is just another restriction which the individual earlier aptly pointed out. He doesn't like looking at a home because it's not his subjective taste. I'm not going to go over, like I say, what everybody else did. I would recommend or would hope that you would not adopt this plan as written. I would hope that you would continue this so you could get more information and explicit facts on how it will affect property owners and the county in the future. And basically, it is a bad plan. Everyone talks about rolling back, roll back to the original plan and what its intent was. I find out a month and a half ago or two months ago that a plan was adopted last year that all migrated lots are now part of the SRP zone because it did not take into consideration the building. So then they decided that they wanted to put in structures. You can build a structure that is 40 foot high, 10,000 feet, and hide it behind big trees, you wouldn't know it was there. So the, there is an idea that this is going to solve all the issues and satisfy all the people on their aesthetics and their subjective belief or what they like to look at. And I hope that this commission realizes that you cannot satisfy everybody, but this is just a, one more encroachment and usurpation of the use of our land. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Uh, we'll now take a 10 minute recess and reconvene at five minutes to 11.
All right, I'd like to call the, the uh, meeting back into session. Uh, can we call the meeting back into session? We're going, now we're going to have a, uh, a rebuttal by the staff. Could I have a quiet, please? Thank you. Um, I think before I would like to accept Exhibit J that was submitted before. Thank you. Uh, all right, at this point we're having a, a rebuttal by the applicant. Mr. Chairman, uh, Dennis Hawkins again for the staff. Uh, several comments have, have come up that uh, I've been asked to uh, address. One is uh, the question of legal notice. As I mentioned before, this project included an eight-page ad in the uh, Ventura County Star. Uh, individual notices were sent to individuals that requested notification of this matter, as well as all of the property owners within the Lake Sherwood area that were proposed for rezoning, uh, along with other public agencies. Additionally, notice was presented in the, uh, in the county's website, along with the staff report and other, other documentation. Uh, these requirements are, are in compliance with the state law with regarding general plan amendments and zone changes. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Hawkins. Uh, Mr. Hahn and Mr. Ray, who are up in uh, Cuyama Valley, Cuyama Valley. Forth, would they would they have been noticed? In they were mail? not proposed for rezoning. Now they they were noticed in, or whoever owned their property back in 2008 when the SRP was modified because that area was rezoned from SHP to SRP, and those properties were individually noticed at that time. But they they wouldn't be noticed for this these. Their minutes. notice their notice was in the Ventura County Star Free Press on eight page ad. They would not have received an individual notice unless they had requested uh, notification. Thank you. Uh, second, uh, a number of people spoke to issues that are really raised in the uh, general and special exemption section of the proposed ordinance. Uh, I'll just remind you that uh, restoration of land uh, after a uh, a, natu a natural disaster it does not require an SRP permit. It's exempt. Um, regrading of previously ag irrigated agricultural land does not require a, a permit. Now a question was raised as to what if the land is fallow for a period of time and we have discussed the possibility of whether or not we should put a time frame on, on how long it could remain fallow before we uh, would allow that exemption to, to be in effect. That would be up to your commission if you wish to uh, continue this matter for two weeks we could come up with language to address that if you wish uh, let me clarify the question was not on the grading the question was on if it's allowed to be um, gone to seed so to speak and the natural vegetation in the area reestablishes itself on this property um, that's the question right now the exemption applies to any regrading but does not specifically say vegetation removal so I think that particular question was a, certainly a, a, a valid question to to ask. And if your commission is desirous of us looking at that specific exemption further, we would request the um, two weeks uh, continuance. Uh, go ahead and close the public hearing. We'll discuss all the other issues uh, that you wish us to come back with, but we would only open it up for the purpose of that one change. And that would be simply a suggestion. A little follow-up. I assume you would then coordinate with the Ag Commissioner on what the, the best management practices in that regard would be? We would be looking in, certainly within the uh, county family for uh, advice as to what the appropriate limits. Um, but again, we, we could only go so far in terms of the nature of the changes that would not cause the environmental document to have to substantially change. If we do that, then we would say, well, <laughs> not not under this amendment uh, a process. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one comment. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Mr. Smith, are you saying that right now it's your interpretation that if I let my land lie fallow for 
a year or two, I can go in and replant without a permit? For the regrading, that's correct. The question was what happens for, and typically you, you won't have reestablishment other than grasses, which in a lot of those grasses are non-native. And so there's probably most of, the, most of our experience is that within that short period of time, you're not going to see reestablishment of, you know, uh, large amounts of native vegetation. But I can't, since I'm not a biologist myself, we, we can't answer that question here today. We'd have to look at what's the reasonable period of time and whether or not this exemption can be expanded to include both grading and vegetation removal and association with the reestablishment. We understand, we understand the desire to not um, require discretionary permit um, for the redevelopment of agricultural land, but there's a period of time which is reasonable because there were some lands that were perhaps uh, farmed uh, at the turn of the century which have been lying fallow for all this time and you could not tell if it was natural land or... So we get into those sorts of questions. So we just can't answer that question today. Thank you. Okay, one, one speaker raised a question about potential conflicts with the uh, state housing law and the housing element. Um, I'm informed that the, uh, how the state housing law exempts scenic resource as, as one of the issues that uh, would restrict uh, public housing, or not public housing, but affordable housing. And the housing element does not include the uh, uh, housing in the single, in SRP zoning to, uh, as, as part of the housing inventory. Uh, so it's not, the, the housing element is not affected, what I'm trying to say is the housing element is not affected by the uh, proposed SRP ordinance. Uh, Mr. Uh, Magney raised some issues regarding environmental review of uh, uh, fire prevention programs. Uh, fire department, uh, in maintaining existing fire breaks, which is what he raised in his letter to us, uh, used a categorical exemption for uh, a particular fire break uh, because the, there's a categorical exemption that says you don't have to do a, a detailed SQL review if you're simply maintaining an existing facility and there are no overriding environmental concerns associated with it. That particular one, after they completed the maintenance of that fire break, uh, there was a discovery of a special status plant. Uh, that changes the circumstances that the fire department is aware of that when, when they re maintain it again some years in the future, this categorical exemption would no longer be in play. However, for construction of new fire breaks or fire clearance projects such as the, uh, the Fillmore Front fuel modification program that was approved about a year ago or so, fire department is required to go through the standard CEQA process negative declaration, mitigated negative declaration, or EIR depending on the circumstances. Um, and that's what we meant by a duplication of, of effort in terms of doing the scenic resource protection. Uh, because if a environmental document is prepared, it does require that they also address issues such as scenic resources. Um, I think we already addressed that one. Uh, Pat Baggerly raised an issue associated with uh, uh, the type of permit required. It suggested that oil permits, for example, should continue to require a conditional use permit in the SRP zone, and they would. That's because oil permits are conditionally permitted uses. Uh, if an SRP permit is also required, it would be folded into the conditional use permit and they'd be subject to the conditional use per permit standards as to whether it was approved or not. What we're saying is in the SRP zone, if no other permit is required, then the proper permit should be a plan development permit, uh, which does not require peri periodic reviews. And I think that... Uh, All right, one, one gentleman raised an issue uh, related to his property, which is in the 
Lake Sherwood area, but outside the existing community portion of the Lake Sherwood area and ask that he, his property be removed. He also, I think, indicated that you can't see his, project, his property from Potrero Road. Under the general exemption that we're recommending, if you can't see the proposed improvement from the regional road network, which is Potrero Road in the Lake Sherwood area, or from Lake Sherwood itself, no discretionary permit would be required. So effectively, he has been removed from the SRP if his statement that he can't be seen from the from, the, from those public locations is, is correct. Um, another gentleman raised the issue related uh, raised an issue related to the grading ordinance. Uh, the grading ordinance is up for review by the Board of Supervisors. I don't know how that's going to play out, what those regulations are going to be. This SRP ordinance does not conflict with that. It simply describes when a discretionary SRP permit is required. It doesn't say whether or not a grading permit is required by the Public Works Agency. That will be subject to their standards. Um, the grading ordinance affects uh, stabilization of slopes, uh, water runoff, and, and issues such as that related to public safety. The scenic resource protection looks at it from a different perspective, from the perspective of will the grading have a significant effect on aesthetics. And so the, the, the issue is looked at from two different, di different angles based on the two different purposes of the two different ordinances. And I think that uh, concludes our response unless we have additional questions. Uh, questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you for hitting a lot of the high points. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. A uh, number of questions regarding the 1,000 as far as grading and the vegetation versus 4,000 and that impact when you have a 10-acre property. In other words, the, the scale and scope as, a, mm -hmm. as opposed to the size of the property. Um, the 1,000 was selected or reviewed, or did we look at a larger number? Any background on that? Yeah, the, we actually started with, I think, 200 square feet. <laughs> And, and gradually it morphed, but uh, 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 there's nothing magical about a thousand. It's consistent with uh, small structures, which is the direction that the board gave us. It would allow, a, for example, a, a second dwelling unit, which is a 900 square foot limitation for properties between 10,000 and 2,000 or 10,000 and five acres. Um, to, ex to increase the size to 4,000 square feet, and we did look at going larger, but the problem with that is is we think that that has the potential to have significant impacts uh, depending on how far away it is from the public viewing location, depending on whether it's a hillside property. If you go to 4,000 square feet, it allows a fair, fair amount of construction. Uh, but it's a, it's a just it's a subjective determination, and if your commission can make a determination that that would not cause a significant environmental effect, then perhaps we could use the negative declaration. In our view, it sort of pushes things into the EIR category. Not that it shouldn't happen, but that the environmental document uh, should be beefed up. Pardon? Are we really talking about an environmental effect or are we talking about an effect on the view shed? Well that is well effect some on people the view separate shed is an environmental the effect. And that is the principal environmental effect that we're that this ordinance addresses. Okay. I'm sorry, Bruce <laughs> Yeah. Um, the um, the environmental document that is proposed has what the exceptions are and our assertion is that if you fundamentally change that, let's say to 4,000, that document doesn't work. It has to be recirculated. I'm not, dis I'm not predisposed to whether or not that would be significant or not per se. However, part of the criteria that we looked at is when, what is that break point between when a structure, for instance, is large enough to be potentially significant? Now, from a public policy standpoint, you may want to say, well, we want to establish it at 10,000 square foot dwellings or what have you. Um, that's fine from a public policy standpoint, but if the effect of loosening the standard would have a significant visual impact, that demands an EIR. 
and a negative declaration would not be the proper document to do that. Conversely, modifying the vegetation removal standards in a manner which would lead to potential significant adverse impacts would require an EIR instead of the document we have before you. So one of the questions is, we have proposed an ordinance with the parameters that it has based on a negative declaration. And uh, certainly relatively minor tweaks to the wording, it was, if it's within those parameters, the environmental document will work. If you go substantially beyond that, the environmental document does not work and would have to be, we would have to go back to square one on that. <clears throat> so if I understand what you said, the consideration, because you answered two questions in my mind, the second dwelling, which is uh, allowed by law, and you feel that the 1,000 feet kind of gets you, it, so there's not that conflict, but at the same time, it, you don't uh, have to recirculate any kind of a environmental document. That's correct. Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Any other questions of staff at this point? Rodriguez. Um, on the staff report, where when it talks uh, speaks to the issue of expansion of existing structures, mm -hmm. um, numerous places in the text throughout the report uh, references. Uh, Expansion of 20 percent over of the beyond the original structure, square footage of the original structure, or um, or a thousand square feet, whichever is larger, or a thousand square feet, whichever is larger. Fine, um, and 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 I don't have an issue with that. I guess my question is, after this has been permitted, built, and completed, what's to prevent me from coming back in and duplicating that same application a year later? The requirement is cumulative, so a cumulative okay. expansion of 20 percent. Okay, then I think, that, then I think the regardless. text needs to say yes. cumulative. I believe it already does. Uh, no, it doesn't. Oh, then, then uh, we there's should add that. There's there because um, we've dealt with this uh, with the uh, similar issue with the uh, uh, coastal zone, zoning uh, uh, coastal zoning ordinance uh, restrictions on uh, on size and, and scope of structures down there. Um, and if, if there's a gap to drive a truck through, it'll go through. And I've personally seen construction uh, that's been done in sections to avoid the restrictions and requirements of, of, uh, that come with uh, uh, modifications to structures when the roof line or the footprint exceeds the original 50 percent of the original footprint. I, I see there was that. So there was a, there was that error. The original language said cumulative. When we uh, combined the words, we left out the word. So we'll put that back in if you're if you direct. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions of staff at this point? If not, I'd like to close the public hearing. We can begin our deliberations. Commissioners, what is your pleasure? I'm concerned that a lot of people have told us that they didn't receive sufficient notice of this hearing today. I recognize that staff has complied with all the legal requirements, but I've heard a lot of people say that they would like an opportunity to study this further, and I think because the county is the applicant, I think we can afford them the opportunity to do that. And I would respectfully request that we continue this hearing for whatever period of time is reasonable in the eyes of the commissioners. and give uh, the public at large an opportunity for further input. For myself, during that period of time, I would like staff to review the issue of a categorical agricultural exemption, which to me seems appropriate if it can be done in such a way that we don't completely eviscerate the view shed. I'm also concerned and agree with a great many people that the 1,000-foot restriction should be expanded to 4,000. I'm mindful now that staff tells us the environmental document is insufficient for that purpose. So I would like to hear from staff on these, these issues and discuss them a little further. That would be my request. 
Commissioner Wessner. Uh, <clears throat> if that's your motion. Uh, that is my motion. Thank you. Then I'll second that motion simply because I, I also agree. Uh, first of all, again, as always, commend the staff. You have been given a mountain to move, and you've artfully and skillfully done it, but as always, there's other things that come up in matters like this, and I believe enough questions have been brought forward um, that further discussion and details that need to be brought forward and clarity. Uh, if there's any misconceptions, we can certainly address. Uh, I certainly want to thank all the people who have come out here because of that. It's good to hear your voice. Uh, I hate to tell you, a lot of times we do things up here, but there's nobody in the room. And so we, uh, we appreciate, regardless of what your position is, at least we know what you're thinking and, and pointing out things to us. So uh, with that, I, I wholeheartedly... Uh, now, I recommended 2012 to the director, but she didn't want to go along with 2012 as far as the continuation date. Uh, <laughs> so before we vote, do we have a, a reasonable date that we can move this forward to? Well, while they're looking it up, let's see if there's any more discussion on this. We have a motion and a second for a continuance, and we're talking about the time of the continuance, so let them look it up. Commissioner Rodriguez? Um, I... I uh, I have to commend staff for what obviously has been an awful lot of work over a long, prolonged period of time, um, difficult and trying, I'm sure. Um, and and I, I tend to, I tend to uh, uh, support. Uh, I'm tending to, I'm thinking that I probably will be able to support recommend staff action. But I do have some issues, and I think that request for continuances is is, is appropriate uh, as well. Um, I think it would give staff uh, a more thorough opportunity to properly respond to a lot of the concerns that were raised here today. And I realize staff has made uh, a very good effort in a short period of time, but I think uh, these people, uh, I think, deserve a uh, appropriate airing of uh, and response to their concerns. Um, I, I didn't. I think. Uh, I think the uh, the changes we're making up in the Lake Sherwood area are. As far as moving that uh, urbanized area out of the SRP zone is is probably long overdue and appropriate at this point. Um, uh, we've also had uh, uh, communication uh, by people not present uh, from that same area, I believe, requesting uh, continuance if at all possible. As this certainly would allow the opportunity for those people um, to make themselves present if they choose to to make themselves present. Um, I'd like to see the changes to that text that I just re referenced uh, to Mr. Hawkins. I think uh, uh, yeah. we can't take those things for granted. Um, um, it works for us. It, it's, it makes sense to us now, but five years from now when somebody else is sitting in these chairs and trying to make that interpretation, uh, it creates that, that point to, uh, to argue and drive that truck through. Um, Fallow land, well, ag is, ag uh, that's under cultivation is, is under cultivation, and I can certainly appreciate land going fallow as a necessity of, the, of a successful operation. Um, and to me, uh, land is, that's allowed to go fallow to re nourish itself is, is uh, particularly in an organic type of operation, is certainly uh, logical. Um, and so from my perspective, I was thinking that foul land is still lag under cultivation. However, stretching that definition beyond, uh, beyond the immediacy uh, in time to, I think Mr. Smith referred to land that might have been in cultivation 50 years ago that's long since been overgrown, um, uh, I suppose would require some sort of review process at that point. Um, but I think we need to, uh, maybe ag can give us, the ag uh, uh, people can give us some input on on what sort of timeline we can put on on ag on land that's gone fallow uh, as through the normal course of an operation and when when it would really be appropriate to maybe require a permit uh, if that's what if that's what, what I think what I heard uh, staff saying and, and the uh, comments coming from the audience so I would support a continuation also uh, There are some loose ends, but I think in my mind, the real intent of this, these changes is to, to, to deal with ridge lines and to have a more 
scenic acceptable area that people can look at in our county before anything can happen to uh, destroy that. So I think that's what the intent is. Um, it's obvious now that we have three people who would wish for a continuance. Uh, before I take a vote, I'd like to be certain that uh, of a couple questions. First of all, uh, the issues I thought that were brought up by the commissioners had to do with the thousand square foot pad, the fallow land, the agricultural exemption, and notification. Commissioners, are those the four issues that you want to see addressed on a continuance? Uh, <clears throat> those are the specific ones, but I believe during the discourse we gave staff additional things like uh, the specific cumulative language, uh, okay. the issue of where are we going to physically measure this the view shed from. As I, I want to reiterate, it caused a number of problems almost 20 years ago. If you don't say specifically from that point, once you start extending a line out, it's amazing what does or does not get it included if you're not specific. Yeah. So, I, but I think staff uh, has, has those specific. So I, I would agree with those four points. Is, is staff satisfied with with the directions that the commission is interested in pursuing? I have a point of clarification on the notification. I understood. Um, Commissioner Onstott to say that he would like more notification for the for the process, but did you want more feedback on how the notification was done? Because the county does go over and above the sequin notification. We do we did do a mailing and we did do the eighth page ad. Only one is required. My point was not that the notification was defective as right. such, but that the people requested additional time to respond. Okay, so there's nothing for us to bring back on that particular I don't issue. I believe so. Okay. Although some individual here may claim that they didn't receive notice and want to be put on the list. And I think if anybody here wants to be put on this list, they need to uh, contact um, Dennis or Bruce afterward, and we'd be happy to add you to the list for notification, for a personal notification on this process. Um, have you come up with a, a proper time for the continuance? I haven't looked at all of your schedules, but our schedule would allow for February 18th. I have to check with County Council. Okay, we can. That sounds like an appropriate time period. You just need to have a time certain for that. And just the direction to um, the board, uh, the commission chair, is to again restate the motion clearly so that there is clear direction on that. Fine. Uh, before we do that, council, um, when when we when we when we reconvene after the continuance. Am I right in assuming that the public hearing will only deal with the items that will be brought back to us? We don't have to go through the entire process again? Correct. Uh, the public will have an opportunity to address the matters that are brought back to you. Uh, if it's the 1,000 square feet to the 4,000 square foot building pad, um, how to deal with fallow agricultural land and uh, possibility of an exemption from a discretionary permit. Um, speaking to the issue of cumulative growth and expansion of a particular existing use and the measurement of the view shed. Those would be the specific issues that you would receive. You can and should and uh, receive additional public uh, comment on. Do you want the motion restated then or are your... It would be best if the commission uh, restates the motion and not rely upon council's recollection. Okay. As I said, I'm not sure I can do that. We're moving to continue the hearing to allow the populace an opportunity for additional input. And I guess what I'm hearing is that input will be limited to those issues that we're reserving and asking further, further clarification on. My issue uh, on my motion dealt with agricultural, possible agricultural exemption for grading, clearing, and planting. To possibly increase the thousand square foot to four thousand feet, and and the issue of uh, leaving land fallow uh, should be addressed, and I fall off after that. I'll uh, amend my second to do that, with the understanding that staff has been given direction on certain clerical um, things, such as the cumulative statement and uh, that type of thing. So those corrections which I think are ministerial rather than okay. is staff clear on 
what's being proposed? I don't think that included any, everything that you had on your list. The one thing that, okay, now my recollection is uh, sharpened by that discussion, and I think that there was a question about the measurement of view shed that Commissioner Westner wanted to have clarified. So we'll add that also to the list. Okay, yeah. The specific point of the center line from which you determine. Uh, so we're adding the view shed. It, will you second include that? Correct. All right, now, before, well, are we talking about February 18th as a date certain? That date works for us if that date works for all of you. Time certain, 8.30. I'm, I'm clear for that date, but I'm not certain. Are we all clear for that date? Fine. F February 18th? Will we have our fifth member that day? Hopefully. Hopefully. I'll have to confer with uh, Commissioner Dukas to see if she's willing to watch the video. She should. Again, I wish to thank everyone who came. There was a lot of intensity Com here. Chair, you, Chair, did you take a vote? I'm going to take it right okay. now. He did. Thank thank you. All right. All in favor of a continuance to February 18th, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Again, thank you, everyone for your input. We do appreciate it. It takes time, but it's certainly worth it for us. It helps us. Thank you. Keep dry. Uh, uh, do we have any issues that the planning director wishes to bring up? I have um, just a couple of things. I wanted to um, remind your commission of the very busy schedule that we have on the 11th. We have um, four items on the agenda, and now we'll be meeting on the 18th. Um, and then the last time we met, you, re you asked for two updates um, of where we were with pro projects right now. One of them was the Simi Valley Landfill, and the other ones were the Grimes Canyon Mine. Jim, you want me to wait? I'll wait. This way. Uh, we'd like to continue with the meeting, so if you could take your conversations outside, be out in the hall anyway, because we have a few other items on the agenda. Leo, they don't hear you. I don't believe you. Could I ask you please to carry your conversations outside? We have other items on the agenda. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so the two items that you required, or that you requested updates on the Simi Valley Landfill and the Grimes Canyon mining sites. Um, the Simi Valley Landfill first, the public comment period that was originally scheduled from September 28th to November 11th um, was continued um, till December 28th at the request of the City of Simi Valley and I granted that continuance. So right now uh, the county and the environmental um, consulting firm, SEIC, is in the middle of reviewing all of the comment letters. There was approximately 156 comment letters received. So we're going through that process. Um, we have a meeting with them scheduled on Friday uh, to see what the scope and scale of those are, to see if there's um, any necessity to, to go back and look at timing. Um, if all goes according to plan, I would expect that the um, planning commission for that hearing would occur in June or July of this year. Um, but that is a big if, you know, once depending on those comments, we really need to take a look at those comments and see what they entail. Um, as far as the Grimes Canyon mines, we have been working on those. The best rock staff report, it looks like it's about 85 to 95 percent done. There's air quality issues that we've been working on between the planning department, the applicants, and the um, APCD, and those issues look like they're about to be, uh, negotiations are about to be completed. And if that works out, it looks like we should be to the planning commission also in the July range on that. So it ought to be a, a, a fun summer for the planning commission. So that's an update where we're on those two big projects. Um, and I will bring you back a, a, another update of where we are with the um, 
continuing of the process improvement. I know that you you hear a lot of that here, but the the numbers are the the numbers of the days that it's taking to get projects complete are staggeringly low at this point. Uh, there's been a, a lot of improvement. You know, we had the discretionary permit coordinator. We've gone over the get to excellence plan um, here before. We have the new application. You can make appointments with the discretionary permit coordinator. They walk you through the process. So it's really shortened the review to get projects complete from months to a month. And uh, I'll bring back some of that data for you to look at. We've given that to the board should recently. Have requested you outline that process to these people. Uh, we've we've outlined it to them. Um, almost all of them are members of the voice of the customer. Com you know that comes. We have very much of a huge outreach program on that process. And so um, there's some some noted exceptions here, but uh, each one of those could be. Uh, Debated from the planning department staff either way. So, but I do want to bring you bring you back, show you what you've been we've been doing for the last um, 18 months. We've made great progress, and uh, probably not on the next two agendas because it's so full. But probably sometime in March, we'll bring you back that. Okay. okay when you have a situation like we had, where there was no no objection regarding removing the uh, the urban community, from, is there possible? Can we cherry pick and approve that? that portion of his own change? No. Or do you have to do the whole thing? You have to look at the environmental review. The, the, it typically requires a general plan amendment. No, there, there's not a lot of cherry picking allowed in the world of uh, general plan amendments and zone changes and, and what portion you can or cannot remove from an SRP zone. There is a lot of negotiations that just went into the uh, Sherwood and whether we could do that with the environmental review that we've done. And so, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a complex process. Yeah, it seems like uncontested matters should be able to pass through. Ah. You want us to keep our agendas, I'm assuming. Yes, please. Please keep your agendas, and then we will, we will do a report back, and we'll give you some follow-up information prior to the hearing on the 18th. Any other comments? By yes. The uh, Kim, um, yes. You know, this issue of notification keeps coming up, or lack of notification. Um, has planning or... Uh, uh, RMA explored uh, the benefits of a reverse directory notification? No. Uh, a telephonically, mm -hmm. just computerize, computerize the message, very basic, and, and just a telephone notification to the, to the telephone you know, on site. Uh, at that address, much like we, we get notified. Like the reverse 911? Uh, or a potential disaster issue that's going to impact a particular area. Uh, the appropriate authority programs in the numbers to be notified and the computer takes it from there with the message. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive or elaborate, uh, but it, the technology exists. Uh, I'm not sure what the notification on if we would have adequate records of who was actually notified or they would, you know, their phone could be turned off or they don't sure. have an answering machine. Sure. Yeah, we're ne never going to be 100 percent. I just... Uh, you, you, know, you are never going to be 100 percent, but I do think that the county does a very good job in this regard. And if you would take a look at our web page... Just the opening of our web page shows the very first two buttons up there. One of them is, are you interested in SRP? And the other one is, are you interested in the assembly use ordinance? So those buttons will take you to every staff report that we've done. So we've gone really over and above on these ordinance biz by designing our web pages around them. The second thing that we've done is... Now that we we are having, because I think that when people get public notifications, you know, they come stuffed in a county envelope. I'm not sure, you know, they're they're black and white. They look very governmental. I'm not sure people are really reading those and, and understanding those. So what we're doing now is we're going to a uh, a postcard, bright orange. Hey, something is happening in your community. You should pay attention and you know put a put a little map in the corner and show them really what's going to impact them. So we're moving to that direction. Um, we've started that process, but it's going to be in full swing next week because you know we really want the public's engagement and so we're trying to figure out all the different ways that we can go about it we we maintain a very large homeowners association list and update that at the expense of the planning department every year we go out and we and we map them and so we know if we're anywhere near a homeowners association we send it to them hoping that they'll get the word out and we have a very large list of state and local and federal agencies environmental you know uh, uh, coalitions that we can continually send this word out. So when people are saying that they're not hearing about it, I mean, I don't doubt that. 
I, I don't doubt that people don't read the eighth page ad in the paper. So that's why we're really trying to go over and above and send out 700 mailings, and that required the, you know 10 people in the planning department to step down and stuff envelopes all afternoon because we want the word to be out. So, I, I mean, I can investigate that, but from a uh, I'm not well. I'm not sure we have the budget and the money for it right now, but it's definitely worth worth looking into. Well, I wasn't for the one moment saying you didn't give them adequate notice. I think they were requesting more time. And more time is something that we hear routinely at hearings. So even though a process has been going on for maybe 18 months and we've been out to the community and been out to the MAC and been out to Ventu Park and, and kind of shopped this around and then the environmental document goes out, there's a big notice on that. It's always when you come to the hearing that there wasn't enough notification because this is the time that people truly start paying attention to the process. And that's not your fault. Well, we're working on it. Thank you, Kim. Anything else? Next meeting is on the 11th. Four items. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank adjourned. you.